So there's this movie out right now called um, Avengers Endgame um, that I had some thoughts on. Hey Justin, I'm recording. Don't don't mind me. So here's the thing. I don't I don't like how uh, how negative I've become on my channel lately, even though those are all my honest opinions. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna sandwich this video with, with positive and negative and all that, but, um, I mean, I shouldn't justify giving a movie criticism, because that's just what I feel about the movie, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get on with my thoughts. Also, as the movie just came out last night, these are very preliminary thoughts, my opinions might develop in either direction, we'll see. So. I don't think the movie is as airtight as Infinity War, for starters. Infinity War feels very much like one solid block of storytelling. Endgame kind of feels like three different episodes of a TV show, or not a t maybe not a TV show, but it feels like three separate episodes in one movie. It feels like the recruiting episode, the time travel episode, and then the final showdown episode. and. I don't know. On one hand, it's a cool way to break down a movie, but on the other hand, it's not just that that's how I broke it down, it's that the sections were kind of disjointed in how I experienced it, which is not a great thing. The stakes also felt ironically lower than Infinity War. I think part of it might be that the movie starts out at rock bottom, half the planet is wiped out, and Sure, we have the threat of losing main characters, but for the most part, it doesn't feel like it can get much worse. But I don't think that's the whole reason it felt kind of low stakes. I think a lot of that had to do with tonal issues the film has. I was impressed with Infinity War because it was able to deliver good jokes that didn't undermine the serious um, backbone of each scene. And I don't think they nailed that balance quite as well in this movie. There are a lot of scenes, especially in the first hour or so, that just totally rob the movie of any um, stake, I guess. All the stuff with Thor just did not land. Here's the thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to stop comparing this movie to Infinity War, but that's a little impossible. But I feel like... With Thor's character, Infinity War kind of perfected the balance of, like, he can he can be a smartass-ish like he is in Thor Ragnarok, but also, like, at, at the heart of it, he's this, uh, this kind of ignorant, almost Drax-like character that totally changes over the course of the, the five-year time jump that Endgame takes place in, and I think that's for the worse. Um... And why don't I why don't I just get into characters right now? Because a lot of them were handled well, a lot of them were not handled very well. It's kind of ironic that Infinity War juggles a lot more characters in less time, and Endgame, of course, narrows down and has a longer runtime, but somehow I feel like Infinity War is able to flesh out all these character moments in in a way that Endgame doesn't necessarily develop in in my opinion. I feel like there was more of a sense in Endgame that we're just juggling a lot of characters and it's it's kind of there's a joke to be made here about Thanos and perfect balance and him succeeding in Infinity War and Infinity War succeeding in perfect balance and Thanos failing in this movie, and this movie not having perfect balance. But I, I don't have the capacity to make that joke right now. But with Thor's character, they he has an arc. He's reconciling with the fact that he didn't succeed in killing Thanos. Uh, I mean, everyone is, but specifically Thor. But the catharsis he gets feels not very organic. Um, he has a conversation with his mom which we never really get a sense of of why that maternal relationship is important to him. Maybe in the first two Thor movies, it's been a long time since I saw them, but we don't feel that at all in this movie. And, 
I mean, it could really be anyone who tells them that, you know, oh, things are gonna, things are gonna be okay, you, you, I mean, everyone messes up. I don't know. I liked Professor Hulk a lot more than I expected to. That was one of the things I was worried about going into the movie, and he was actually a lot of fun. Uh, however, <laughs> his very existence kind of undermines the arc they began with Hulk in Infinity War, um, because he's, he's battling, or, I don't know, it just, there's a time jump, and he's like, yep, I, I fixed everything, and now I'm the perfect Hulk state, and it just feels like they started something and changed their minds about exploring that in between movies, even though I think these were filmed pretty close together. Hawkeye, again, has an arc that we don't really feel. He's, um... He's, he's gone rogue. He's Ronin. Um, one, I don't know how great of a job the film does establishing that he's like he's gone haywire. We get the one scene in Tokyo, and Black Widow tells him, like, look what you've become. But I feel like the rest of the movie, he doesn't really reflect on the fact that, like, oh, I've been, I've been killing people until the, the scene where Black Widow and him are fighting over who gets to die and he sees this as an opportunity for catharsis and then at that point I was like oh yeah he's he's actually going through something I feel like the film didn't do a good job keeping that consistent um maybe they just wanted some cool Tokyo action maybe they just wanted Hawkeye to speak Japanese who am I to say but yeah I don't I don't know what exactly the difference is explicitly I can't pinpoint it but something about the way the arcs were handled here feels like they are established and wrapped up but there's not a general sense of that arc which isn't great criticism on my part but what can you do Captain Marvel's role in the film is is fine in a vacuum I just have a problem with the fact that Marvel with the end or er, end credit scene of um the last movie, and then, like, all year they've been hyping up Captain Marvel as the release right before Endgame. We think she's gonna have this huge, crucial role, and it's like, on one hand, the whole time that was going on, I was worried that introducing this character right before the, the big finale and her being the savior would kind of seem like a cop-out, so... I was actually kind of glad that she didn't have a big role in the film. It's just a little... They kind of wedged themselves into a corner with the marketing, maybe? The marketing? But also kind of the content of the film. It was also a little questionable with her character. Like, there's a scene where Thanos is, like, headbutting her, and she's just not budging. She's just taking it. But then there are other scenes where he's just fucking whacking her 30 feet away. Um, that's not necessarily a character thing. That's more a power level thing, but still noticeable. It had to do with Captain Marvel. Tony's arc is very clear. That was handled well. I, I think everything with Tony was great. Steve Rogers was also good. Uh, he doesn't necessarily have an arc, per se, unless you consider going back to Peggy an arc, but um, I don't know. I mean, Captain America is always the, the, the rigid um character and his arc is almost remaining rigid while everything else happens around him um and that again worked Th those two characters it worked in this movie i think what honestly might be the best part about this movie at all is um the fact that they made nebula a prominent character and they explored so much of her that we got glimpses of in like guardians 2 some in infinity war but she's she's like probably in the top, I don't know about, maybe top three of the prominent characters in this movie, and it just really, really worked for me. I, I was really happy about that. The biggest thing regarding the characters that I have a problem with is Infinity War spends all this time developing Thanos, and it does an incredible job, and, and we get him to this, this place of power, and then... In this movie, it's a Thanos 
before he does any of the stuff in Infinity War, before all of that character development. And it's just like, what's, what's the point? Maybe not what's the point, but it's hard to feel as um, invested when the antagonist is stripped of all this development. He's the same person, but he hasn't gone through all the stuff he went through in Infinity War, and that really, really bothered me. And also, um, it's not necessarily like a terrible thing, but the the Gamora stuff is a little questionable. Um, I'll have to see how that plays out in the rest of the MCU, but um, within the movie, that was kind of left intentionally open-ended, but a little more open-ended than I would have liked. It's It's hard to tell what exactly they were going for with her. But yeah, a lot of my problems with this movie are just inherent time travel movie problems. And that's the the unfortunate when I when I watched Infinity War, I knew the next movie would have to involve time travel in some capacity. And so I was I was prepared for the worst. I think it was handled decently, but um time travel's hard to do. And that shows in this movie. For one thing, the the time travel explanations are like as clunky as they could possibly be. Um, Bruce Banner's explaining that, well, that past will become our future and our current present, or what the fuck does he even... I don't remember how he worded it. All he had to say was, if you go back in time and change one thing, it splits off, or branches off, into an alternate timeline. Which is, which is pretty easy to understand. And Tilda Swinton's character, I forget her name, like, illustrates that very simply. So, I don't know. There's, there's no reason for that convoluted explanation. It made it sound a lot more complicated than it actually is. But the film also defies the time travel rules it established. Because the whole movie, we see them creating these alternate timelines. And then at the end... Steve Rogers goes back in time and he alters things. It's it's a diff- it's different from their timeline. But then he winds up in that same timeline at the end as an old man and maybe I'm I'm not maybe I'm missing something, but that doesn't seem like it is consistent with the time travel rules established in the film. Old man Steve Rogers should be in a different timeline, theoretically. This is also more of a nitpick, but it did bother me. Uh, they made this huge deal about, oh, we only have enough Ant-Man juice, uh, we only have enough Pym particles to for one round trip for each of us. And they say it like three times as though it's this big thing that's like, like those are the stakes. And it does a good job establishing stakes, except for the fact that they can just go back in time to, like, 2014 Ant-Man and be like, Hey, Mr. Pym, can we get some more of your particles, please? And they can have a theoretically infinite number of um, Pym particles. So that that bothered me, but it's it's whatever. Because there is a scene where they go back in time and, and... or they go back further and get more Pym Parter. It's kind of like wishing for three more wishes from a genie. But then, yeah, there it, it calls to question that they could possibly go back and bring certain characters back, and it would only affect that timeline. And sure, there's the ethical question of do we benefit our own timeline at the cost of this other timeline? Um, that could have been... Uh, that's not very related so I, I see why the movie didn't explore that as much but it does raise questions about that but I the first hour or so was tonally rough for me but the second hour the the second segment the time travel stuff was I I was again not invested I felt like there was no there were no stakes to it it didn't feel like a climactic final whatever for this whole middle section um and a lot of that has to do with just the way these things played out 
Hulk gets an Infinity Stone by having a very brief conversation with Tilda Swinton, but there's not even... A, a conversation can be very powerful as a scene, but this is literally just... She says no, and then he points out that Doctor Strange gave Thanos the stone on purpose, and she's like, oh, I guess I was wrong, here you go. And there's, there's like, no tension there. No genuine tension. There's tension because she refuses at first, but there's no real reason for there to be tension. I liked a lot of the repetitions um, at the end with the, the Mr. Stark, except this time it's, of course, Tony dying. Um, the Avengers Assemble, of course. The I Am Iron Man line was very good, in my opinion. Sebastian. It's 820. Your alarm's going off. You have to go, you have a job. You have to go to work. What do you what do you want me to do? I'll hit the snooze, I guess. Shit. Okay. Well. Okay. I really hated that um, Tony getting hit by Avengers One Hulk at the door and losing the Tesseract was like a major plot point. Because it's just one of those stupid coincidences that, like, maybe in, like, a Jeremy Saulnier film, that'd make sense because those movies are about, like, all the, the small things that can go wrong. But that's not what these movies are about. And they, they operate in the logic that um, it's more of a, a... What am I trying to get at? These movies operate in a way that these kinds of stupid coincidences don't really have any stakes so when they do happen it's it feels unearned it feels like the movie shouldn't have been affected or the story shouldn't have been affected this much by such a, a minor thing that bothered me i wasn't too sold on the captain america versus captain america fight it was it was fun but it doesn't reveal much in terms of character and the military base, there was also very little tension, I found. Um, there was Helen from Drake and Josh, who was ratting on them. But aside from that, I don't know, it feels like most of them got off really easily retrieving those Infinity Stones. Um, and also, I feel like that whole thing was kind of a bit of an excuse to turn Endgame into a clip show episode of a TV show. I don't know. That sort of thing just feels cheap and manipulative in a bad way. Um, there's more There's more bad CGI. That's not, that's not a huge complaint, but for instance, when Captain Marvel is flying around in space, there's no reason that should have looked as bad as it did. I didn't like the way Thor's fake beer belly looked. I don't know. There were a few things. The final battle looked like a World of Warcraft cutscene or something. I will say that even though it looks like World of Warcraft, the final battle is is uh let's not beat around the bush. It's it's pretty pretty epic if I do say so myself. Stuff like um when everyone shows up, all those money shots. I thought it was funny that um Spider-Man kind of steals the money shot from all the... It's all the people on Titan lining up the Guardians and uh, Doctor Strange. And then it just pans over to Spider-Man. And he... I don't know. I like that. And all the other money shots as well. I liked that... Um, I, I like the scene where Steve Rogers gets the hammer. It was, of course, foreshadowed in Age of Ultron. And I don't know. I was I was cool with that. What I wasn't as cool with is the fact that he immediately starts, like, wielding these, um, these thunder powers, or lightning powers that, um, Thor has. I always thought it was Thor being the god of thunder that he could 
do all that stuff but it was really just the the hammer and even though like you have to be worthy to wield the hammer and that's thor's whole thing um i don't know i feel like it, i felt like it kind of robbed thor of those powers a little bit to have captain america control lightning and stuff the jokes in this movie just just mostly aren't funny um i can i can list some specifics but Overall, there were just a lot more misses than hits, and that really dragged the film down, in my opinion. One joke that I did find funny was the, uh, what if we killed baby Thanos, um, thing, just because of, of, of course, the whole, uh, what if we killed baby Hitler hypothetical, <laughs> and, um, you know, on, on one hand, it's a f funny joke, but then it's also legitimizing the comparison of Thanos to Hitler, which is some some pretty heavy stuff. I don't know, that, that one joke worked really well for me. Again, when Steve first gets the hammer, that was the one scene that got a lot of applause. It was a surprisingly quiet crowd when I saw it. There were, there were very few um, outbursts. There were some collective crying at the end, some laughs here and there, some cheers, but it was a pretty tame crowd, which surprised me. This movie is three hours, and they were insistent on it being three hours, and I walked in thinking like, yeah, this is a big story. I'm sure, you know, it was probably like a five hour cut that they, they, they cut down to three hours. Um, but it was, it was not as airtight as I was expecting, I guess. That's partially because Infinity War is airtight, and it's only like 20 or 30 minutes shorter. But there was, I felt like there was a lot that they could trim from this cut. Um, I don't know, I had some editing problems with it. It felt just very clunky, of course mismatched tonally, that's more with the direction than the editing, but... And the worst offense of all, in my opinion, they're setting up... All these, all these spin-offs at the end. Guardians of the Galaxy 3, uh, Spider-Man Far From Home, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and there's no WandaVision set up. How, how am I supposed to get hyped for WandaVision if they don't even set it up in Endgame? I don't generally love sequel baiting, but I'm not gonna lie, this movie got me pretty hyped for Guardians Volume 3. Um, I don't know how it's going to play out with, with Thor being part of the group. I don't know how they're going to explore the whole Gamora thing. Um, and that's more of a concern than a, than an intrigue. But for the most part, I'm, I'm pretty hyped for the movie. The very beginning, I thought, was really strong. I, I didn't love the first hour collectively, but it started off really strong. The, um, the, the stuff with Tony and Nebula and the ship... The five years later stuff, when it's showing like the wake of this apocalyptic... It feels like an apocalypse movie for the first 20-30 minutes. Then it turns into a time travel movie. But, but the first... The beginning is really good. The focus group scene... Um, I liked that a lot. You gotta love Korg. How can you not love Korg? I liked how it started out with Thanos, that they just killed him right off the bat. Um, I was like, wow, this is, this is audacious. What are they going to do now? Um, I knew we weren't done with Thanos, but I was wondering how they were going to bring him back. Unfortunately, I didn't love how they brought him back, because I think having past Thanos be the enemy now just waters down so much of the story. I, I actually can't express enough how much that upsets me. I guess all the... the kind of a prologue before the five years later was was all great um yeah the movie got off to a really strong start uh the stuff with tony and steve when at first his, his first reaction is you know i i couldn't get him but then you know he sort of rekindles the the hostility between the two of them i thought was handled really well the funeral one take i thought was was great of course i think <laughs> Throughout the movie, the first AC was struggling a little to pull focus, but but that one take was pretty great. It was like, here's the MCU in one scene. 
I heard someone refer to this movie as a victory lap for the MCU, which feels apt. Um, I, I like that aspect of it. I just wish all these other things were handled better so I could be, be fully, I could fully embrace this victory lap. Thor with the, the, the bearded braid and the, the dual wielding was, was pretty great. And I like all the, there's, there are actually so many family relationships in this movie, like families, family units, but then also specific maternal, paternal relationships, especially with Tony. He's got his paternal relationship with Peter, his own father he gets catharsis with, which was good. He's got an actual daughter, um, and his wife, but, but more importantly his daughter. And even the kid from Iron Man 3, who shows up at the funeral, he's sort of a father figure to him too. So, I thought all that stuff was great. Ultimately, I liked Endgame. There's a lot to like about it, especially the last hour. I, I don't think I've done a good enough job saying how, how great the last hour is. Um... I got I got goosebumps watching some of that stuff. But um yeah, I I definitely have mixed feelings and it's a little upsetting that this Infinity Saga has to end on a sort of lukewarm note. It's about 8:30. You want to you want to give some thoughts on Endgame? It's not really until the end of the game. What are you saying? It's different. Like Nick wants to do. You're doing it against Sebastian. Yeah, different. I don't know. Theater. Different theater. Mm-hmm. What about a different theater? It's cool. It's a, a success. It was a success. Sebastian. What? You gotta get up. Okay. You were you were in Dreamlock. I mean that that for. What for? So I didn't get in there. Dude, you're you're still in Dreamlock. Give me the floor, bro. The floor? The floor. Oh, to talk about Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh here. Sit down. Real quick, it's recording. Or I can just I can just Dude, what the fuck are you doing? You wanna talk about endgame? Alright, that's it, never mind. What?